Well, hello there, and welcome to Prolix Comics Bollocks, uh, the show where myself, Nicolas Oshiacon, and uh, himself, Clive Effekin Davis, we talk about uh, comics at length, ad nauseum, in too much detail. Although we might, we might, this might be a, a record. We might have a short show today. Clive says has nothing to say yes. about uh, Hugo Pratt's um, uh, Court yes, of I, I might even age. just go out of frame. Okay. And, and just leave it to be me. replaced by a cup. And I, which has more I to say it. about quarter melties than I do. I'm a little surprised that Clive has so little to say because my understanding was that um, he had a great and uh, fervent interest in uh, semen. And so this is a story <laughs> pre predominantly <laughs> focused on. Uh, all things seafaring, all things nautical. Yes. Um, which Clive and I have talked over the years about. He he is a big fan of all things nautical. This um, is good. Which is why I I thought of this. Well, I didn't. I have to say this came up in a, in the weirdest way. Um, I was reading about the new Suicide Squad movie by James Gunn. Okay, which um, I've not I, seen yet. But... Okay, and uh, it's it's good. I don't think it's as good as the best James Gunn, but it's it's fun. It's mm. a good time waster. It does have a giant starfish uh, going yes. ape shit at the end, which is yeah. which is nice. Um, so, so I was reading about that, and it said it said it was set in this fictional island of Corto Maltese, and then mm. I, for some reason, like follow that rabbit hole as you do when you're it's late at night, and I clicked on that and discovered that Corto Maltese first appears in Frank Miller's um, The Dark Knight Returns, his uh, famous '80s comic about uh, uh you know a batman coming out of retirement and um you know uh right. fighting with superman a lot of the, the the later warner brothers not terribly good cinema is kind of uh inspired by some of frank miller's uh right. 80s grim dark version yeah, well, of those characters we, we've we've talked off uh camera before and we we may even bring it dragging and screaming onto the show at some point but we both kind of have ambivalent thoughts towards Frank Miller and Jay. Oh yes, oh yes, uh, yes. Um, I can appreciate some of what he did for sure. And actually, uh, the the Dark Knight has aged less badly than some of his other work. Um, I right. would say I did read it not that long ago. Um, a little bit along the lines of when we were talking. What the fuck were we talking? I think maybe when we were talking some fucking comic. Anyway, okay. Um, yeah. Uh, we were talking about how Alan Moore was kind of slightly um, didn't kind of was uh, I don't know what the quite right word is but he, he was like slightly uh, well I don't know where my words <laughs> I think um, I think I, I think I remember what you're talking about you're talking about when we were talking about we were talking about probably man thing that's probably why we were talking about Alan right, Moore yes and yeah. then Alan Moore had some ambivalence himself about the role he played in pushing comics into that grim, dark there kind of go. realm with there his watchman. Thank you, Nick. I told you I had nothing to say. You <laughs> yes, to, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, that, that's fine. That's fine. Yeah. So, so um, Frank Miller, slightly in in that respect, I think, like 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 you were saying, yes, I appreciate that. Of course, some of the stuff he did was game changing, but also, <laughs> I, I'm not sure if the the game was changed for the better in the long yes. run kind of thing. Yes, or, yeah. Then again, I suppose there's, I'm, I'm not sure if you're blaming the right person there, you know, the the the, the progenitor or all the people who ran. Yeah, copy it, 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 yeah. yeah. Sure thing. Um, I, I think that's that's very fair. But so, but this whole Corto Maltese thing, so I looked, looked it up, Corto Maltese is an island um, that appears in the Suicide Squad film that originally appeared. And it's obviously named after, as I discovered then, it's named after a character called Corto Maltese, created by Hugo Pratt, uh, a, a very not Italian sounding name for right. an Italian um, comic artist. And upon looking up, I kind of vaguely remember I, I, when I saw the pictures of Corto Maltese, I was like, I sort of remember seeing these in comic book stores, like in graphic novel okay. form, um, a little I'm bit. I'm surprised because I, I assumed that this was a, a long no, no. My favorite that you dragged out of the back. Not of the at all. Oh, oh, this was brand new to me. Ah, um, interesting. 
And so I, I, uh, I found some of the books and uh, I took a look and I almost immediately I, I recommended them to, or for us doing to one of them on the show, well, A, because they were uh, seafaring stories. Mm -hmm. um, and as I said, I, you know, you and I um, have some history with that. I think we both read The Sea Wolf by Jack London and enjoyed yeah, it yeah. Uh, tremendously. Uh, I particularly like the uh, Horatio Hornblower novels as well. And, um, mm -hmm. uh, the, you know, the, the Master and Commander series I'm slowly getting into as well. And uh, right. all, all of these will probably pop up on that uh, other second book mm -hmm. show as well. Uh, yes, I yeah. Um, so, um, so yeah, so basically I, I grabbed it and read the first volume and I think what, what, uh, really struck me and, and it's funny for a show where we're supposed to talk about comics, we mostly talk about stories. I think uh, we don't talk enough probably about the art, the art um, right. but this is for me. And again, obviously different strokes for different folks, but I was completely taken mm. with Hugo Pratt's drawing. Uh, I right. think it's, it's fantastic and it's interesting to see him across this book so this first book and this is confusing because it's been released as a series of graphic novels and the one that's released as number one is actually something he did quite a bit later right it's chronologically okay. set before right. it's the stories right. of the young Corto Maltese but this is the first book that he wrote featuring yes, this character but, but now it's been relabeled two right book two yeah. but basically Ballad of the Salt Sea is what we're is talking about yeah, yeah. And uh, so, from 19, you know, sorry, just to place it, we should but, no, please do. From 1967, yeah. right? And, yes, yeah. and and enormously well respected. Like, um, I noticed checking out on Wikipedia, it's on like uh, Le Monde's list of the hundred yeah. best novels of all time. Like, it's one of the yeah. graphic novels that's on there. So, it, it's yeah, it, it has a real uh, cachet, right? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, the the version I've got has uh, either an introduction or an afterward by Umberto Eco, <laughs> right? Right. You don't, yeah. you don't normally find him at the front of your comic book. Um, you no, know. no, this is true. Um, so and so, when Corto uh, shows up at the very beginning of this story, it is how he would have first appeared to readers. I mean, basically strapped like Jesus, kind of onto a raft floating in the sea. That. It's a pretty great dramatic entrance for a, for a, a character. Um, I recently saw an episode of Ultra 7 where the Ultraman in that was crucified in a, uh, a inside like a glass crucifix by aliens. Awesome. I was very awesome. strange. <laughs> you, can, you can get away with that more though on, on uh, Japanese, uh, you know, stuff. Whereas I think Italians... Um, they're a little closer to the crucifix, maybe, um, culturally right. speaking. But um, but yeah, so um, I've read it twice now, actually. I read it, well, I read it quite a while ago when I first got it, and then I had to kind of reread it a bit because it had evaporated somewhat from my mind. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and so the version I've got has two different translations, which are fairly, right. there's not a big difference between them, but I just went ahead and read the second uh -huh. translation, and it's, it's mostly just idiomatic stuff. Um, yes. It doesn't make any difference to the story. No. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think the things that I, you know, it's funny, like, I wouldn't say I'm going to binge read the rest of them, but I would, like, once a year, I'd be happy to kind of come back and revisit this world of, like, the character himself of, of Corto Maltese reminds me a bit, and I wonder if he was an inspiration at all to uh, Matsumoto Leiji. There's, ah. like, a Captain Harlock Right, uh, and a lot of the the Leiji kind of laconic, um, noble sort of semi-Germanic kind of like you know uh, characters seem to owe a lot to. Mm. to yes, him. I can see that. I can see that. And um, he looks a bit like um, uh, what's his face uh, sideburns and is kind of like as the book story goes on and his face kind of elongates like I noticed that Hugo Pratt's kind of playing with what this character is going to ultimately look like um he begins slightly more kind of squat faced and realistic looking and by the end he's got kind of this long angular features and right. he's got these sideburns and he starts to look quite a bit like um Lupin slightly less goofy ah yeah he does a bit actually yeah yeah right so so, so I'll get to um the kind of 
what, what I thought of this, but but sure. I, I think you 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 probably enjoyed this a lot more than I have. But I'm wondering. I don't know if I did. I don't know if I huge. Oh. I don't know if I actually did hugely enjoy it. Okay. I, 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 just I enjoyed the drawings like... a great deal. The story is is kind of all over the place. And yes, well, see, now I, I'm with you. I, I, I very much appreciate the artwork as well. And I was wondering, actually, is, is Kevin O'Neill a Hugo Pratt? I wondered, and, and definitely uh, Frank Miller as well. Like, there's parts of this kind of very stark black and white uh, look to it, although it is right. being colorized. But that reminded but, me of his, um, uh, the art in his Sin City graphic novels, where right. it's, it's that... But, um, but almost I was positive. strong, real Kevin O'Neill vibes here and yeah, there. in some like, parts. Kind of, yeah. And I like, there's one effect that I quite liked he pulls where um, whenever someone is kind of engulfed by water or drowning or something like that, the yeah. little black squares. That yes. There, like, they make no... Actual sense, but no, they work. But yeah, they evoke yeah. your feeling. Yeah, yeah. I, I thought that too. And I was really taken aback too, like, you know, when this was done, this was not a time, as somebody who kind of dabbles in comics a little bit, um, this was not a time when you could go to the internet and pull up photographs, you know, from above of like, you know, villages uh, in, you know, in Melanesia or like, or, you know, whereas, so I, 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 some of the shots, like, because it's super cinematic, right? There's these incredible yes. vistas yes. or these, you know, as I said, these, scenes from above of like the, the the village how did he do this like where did he did he just you know yeah i i was really impressed right. by some of the the camera angles some of the just the, the draftsmanship yeah yeah but the I, story I, is a bit of a the story is a bit of a mess well it's a shame it's a bunch of like characters said, in it it should be cut um, to me because it's 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 kind of the south seas and it's and it's early 20th century mm -hmm. so there's a little bit of 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 kind of war beginning is the world war one right yeah that stuff's in the which is which is fascinating to me and and the the place is as of a very specific place that's kind of interesting it's nautical as fuck that's interesting yeah. to me mm -hmm. so and but I don't, and, and i there's certain elements of it i really dig like i love the character of the monk Yes, so the yes. monk is 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 kind of like this almost like a Dr. Mabuse kind of yep. like um Uber villain who's who basically oversees all the kind of smuggling and stuff, you know, at, at, in this time and place. And he, you know, it, he's it, it's a monk's habit, a hooded monk's habit, yeah, with literally no face. It's just, yeah, just black. black. Yeah. He's great. Mm -hmm. And I love the fact that he's, yeah, this kind of Mabuse like um Uber. I, I like all that. Um the and Rasputin with... seems to be just actually I, I I would look this up because I was like, is that supposed to actually be Rasputin. is he just called Rasputin because he looks like him? But it right. apparently it is just supposed to be Rasputin. Oh, interesting. He's apparently still wow. alive and has is now and I quite like the psychology of his character, the kind of well, he, managed had to, few... he managed to avoid being killed again. <laughs> yes, yeah, well, there's that. Wow. And then there's the fact that he kind of just um, this desperate wish for friendship, but at the same time, this complete un lack of understanding about how to have a friendship. It's just he's in love with the idea of having a friend, right, but has but yeah, there's yeah. no way he could ever successfully have one, and gets really upset. And even at one point, you know, he kills this like this cranio character just out of nowhere um, yeah. because he basically says he makes a joke like a crack, like you know, you know what I like about you, absolutely nothing. Right. <laughs> And then he just immediately murders him, <laughs> you know. Um, um, Cranio is quite a good character as well. Yeah. Uh, but my problem with it, so the characters are there, the setting is there, everything's, and the art is great. And so it's it's mm -hmm. already, it's all the elements are, are there. The problem I had with it is so much of the narrative is this really creaky, old-fashioned, and, you know, like, ha ha, I am now holding a gun. Boom. I've been yes. hit on the head and passed out. And then they go to another island and they escape. And then, ha ha, I now have a gun on you. Boom. Crack over there. It's like, <laughs> yes. Oh, yes. it just does that. All throughout. And you're thinking, that's yes. such a shame that they transplanted this old creepy adventure kind of um, mm -hmm. 
storytelling on to this otherwise kind of quite fascinating, potentially fascinating world. And I, I do think to some degree that there's less of that as he went on. Um, so, I mean, I have read the next book and it, it, there definitely wasn't as much of that. It seemed a bit more um, Is that subtle. Caribbean Sweet? Yes, yeah, I did read that too. Um, so is that, so, would you say Caribbean Sweet is, is a better graphic novel than Bald of the Salt Sea? Because considering Bald of the Salt Sea is considered the Cote Motel, so I'm just wondering, should I go on to Caribbean Sweet? Is it like, does he get better or...? I would, I would give it a break. I wouldn't go right away. I, I would give it okay. a break, give it right. a few months, and then come back. And But I, I do think you kind of need to read Ballad in order to have a sense of what's going Because, I mean, the, the characters do sort of continue to some degree. We don't see the two kids, Pandora and Kane, which are very... I didn't only realize it with the second read. I was like, these names are ridiculous. Like, <laughs> Pandora and Kane. Um, Apologies but, uh, to any Pandoras and Canes watching. Well. Yeah, yeah. But to, anyway, um, to put those two names together, the, uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, so, um, and there's, you know, that's another creaky piece as well. The whole question about like the, the mis the, there's kind of this mystery that's suddenly grafted in and it, it's so telescoped so often uh, yes. about like who, who the monk really is and all yeah, that, that stuff. It, I was like, yeah, pff, yeah. I pretty I cheesy. Understand without that. Yeah. Um, so the monk, cause the monk just works. Oh yeah. You don't with no context. Backstory. I don't want to know what the monk's yes. backstory is. He's the monk. That's all <laughs> he needs to be, right? Um, yeah. So yeah, um, there's a shit. Actually, he's very uh, he's a very lazy Matsumoto like figure as well. Yeah. If you can think of it. Um, good yeah. Like, good call linking. I I that didn't occur to me, but yeah, no, I think you might be on to something there. Well, there's a romantic, there's a, a manly romanticness about this whole thing, like um you talking then, about you know, this YouTube video, because oh yes, yeah, yeah, this is a bromance of the highest order. Um, but the uh, <laughs> the um, yeah, I mean, you know, there was other. I mean, you know, at the end of the story, at the same time, there's that quite effective piece about the you know the German officer who basically has to be shot um, for following German right. orders. But you know, like it's it's just, you know yeah, it's like the reality that like doing doing one thing for your country makes you a war criminal in another country and you know mm -hmm. um so yeah and you know as i said it's 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 a weird mix of of some of it's quite high concept and some of it's quite low as you said quite low concept i lost track of the number of times that corto was um shot by yes. those two kids who he constantly just immediately yeah. forgave it was like oh it's all right you know um, there's one there's one sequence as well which is when it first occurred to me, because up until then it was um, not exactly realistic necessarily, but it was, a, you know, it was more low key and everything was was in the realm of, uh, you know, kind of believable and mm -hmm. down to earth. And then all of a sudden there's like a there's a, like a rush of the where an octopus grabs him, actually grabs yes. him and pulls him into the water and then a get his foot stuck in a giant clam, clam. something yes. else attacks him and I think what the hell just happened it was it was like yes it was You're like totally the writers right. of like Dan Day or something had run into the room and oh they here, here we go there's someone outside he looked like hey is that all oh, okay and he went down, and they and they rewrote his script or something it was a very weird kind of break but I have to say, I was interested to read when I was just, I was looking on his Wikipedia page a moment ago that right before he did this uh, stuff, uh, you know, he had been working for Fleetway in England, or at least, really? I mean, I mean, he might not have physically been in England. Uh, you know, right. it was quite common in the 60s and 70s for artists in South America, yes. artists in Italy and so on to well, work they, for some the, of the best, work, right? And, well, yeah, yeah. I mean, Massimo Blardinelli, who worked for 2000 AD, um, you know, uh, there, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, there's, ton there, and there's, there's tons of them. Um, I mean, Carlos maybe Esquera. Right. Maybe that bit was Hugo Pratt was yeah. running behind schedule and he grabbed one of his Fleetway scripts and <laughs> just kind of... <laughs> Put it in, yeah. yeah. Um, and then, uh, I mean, Carlos Esquera, who mm. is the original designer of Judge Dredd. I mean, again, I he I can't remember. I saw well, Spain, I think. I think he's actually yes. he was Spanish, not South American. But yeah, there's um so there's a long history of this, but apparently he specifically did war comics 
for Fleetway, and I would love to see just because of that that just that the confidence of his drawing. Yes, you know, is and is I've, so... I've read some of his. I can't remember what it was. Was it was battle or war or something or? But I, I think he wrote. He didn't he draw for those digest ones as well. The ones mm -hmm. that I, I'm pretty sure. Um, and uniformly, the art in the, those are in, incredible. Yeah. Um, Get every bit of a callback to our Charlie's War. Um, right. Well, I was uh, for, I was for long time might, watchers, we might want to uh, dive into some more war comic stuff. Actually, um, the the more kind of typical stuff. Uh, you know, for yes, because uh, that's yeah, yeah. is is pretty interesting. Um. So. So here's my question to you then. So mm -hmm. it seems as if we kind of had a similar experience. I think so. What about this? We we I I thought I thought you were going to be um, maybe a bit more bowled over by it than I was, but uh, it doesn't seem to be. And we seem to have similar reservations. Mm -hmm. But we can carry on dating. It's fine. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We should be. We should be all right. Um, um, but my question to you was because you have a you have a a, a better kind of a, a wider context for this stuff. Why is it, do you think, why is it held in such high regard, do you think? What, what is the appeal of, of Ballad of the Salt and, and Cotta Baltes in general? Why do you think it, it does, is afforded this kind of yeah. elevated status that other comics haven't? Um, I suspect it's to do in part with the timing. I think 67, uh, right, this is 67, I think, yeah. Uh, we said, yeah. Um, there's still a lot of comics as kid stuff, and you're right. This is this is a kind of a, in a weird liminal space between not quite comics for adults entirely, mm -hmm. but not quite comics for kids either, right? Um, and so I think for for readers, probably the thing is you probably have a bunch of people like Umberto Eco who read this at 13 and were like, "Oh my god, finally right. someone's writing comics that aren't, you know, aimed at the lowest common denominator, right? That are kind right. of just." There. And I think sometimes those things. And there may be a zeitgeist yeah. element as well. Like it may have just seized on something that that was, you know, people were excited about or interested in. And then I do think for 67, um, it's it's surprisingly unracist. Um, like it like almost goes bends the other direction to kind of make all of its um characters of color for the most part um sort of like not but not they're not all good people but like but you know like there's a lot there's a kind of a lot of pauses to be like yeah um, i mean the ca cannibals cannibalism does come up but it would have been right. a historical reality but you know what i mean like it's just they're more dignified aren't they than, than yeah and and, than, and and both in the drawing style and in the dialogue that they're given and i think that just continues to be more and more a piece like i mean there are um some kind of um, in the following, well, the one set in the Caribbean, there's a lot of the characters are obviously black, and they're all given um, a lot more um, sympathetic treatment or a lot more uh, nuanced, general, I think. Yeah. nuanced treatment than yeah. you would have seen in comics at that time in a lot of the world. I mean, right. you know, by the mid '70s, you know, Pat Mills was getting in fights at you know um, uh, whatever DC Thompson over like wanting to have like a, a black boxer be the main character in a strip and they're like oh no no he can be the sidekick but you right. can't have that and you know so i think said that the pat bill strikes me as a kind of man who had fights about you know everything i time. didn't ask for cheese and onion crisps i wanted salt and vinegar you know almost anything i would imagine it's entirely possible pat Mills. he seems like <laughs> um, a sensitive fellow <laughs> But I, you know, so, I mean, I, I think it's a lot of those things. So, so yeah, maybe now with the camera kind of pulled back and we can see in context, you know, the same thing, uh, you know, we may at some point do um, one of Will Eisner's early. I mean, he was another person who at this time in the 60s was kind of trying to push the boundaries, the later 60s, in terms of what a comic could be. Um, well, just for a, a, a weird side-by-side -side comparison, as I'm thinking, Probably around the same time, six, seven, and maybe a, a few years after, maybe, and uh, nautical themed. Mm -hmm. And I can't remember if it was in Zap Comics, uh, Captain Piscums and his Merry Men or whatever the fuck. Do you remember that? I think it might have been, uh, who was the, um, 
I forget his name. He, he you know, he was writing alongside Robert Crumb and and uh, not not Gilbert. He, he, not Spain. He was the. He always did those like really extreme kind of sex comics that were in. Oh, not Zach Boy. Oh, okay. Not not um not the guy who did the front cover to that um uh you know Guns and Roses yeah. thing later on Robert Williams. Ah, uh, was no, not Robert Williams. Hang on, I'm actually looking at okay. um, here. We go. Yeah, uh, uh, Zach. Yes, you you talk to the viewers, Nick. Okay, yeah. right. but you can't just Google Captain Fistgums. I can't that's imagine what I, that that's going to have that's too what many I, hits I other S. than Clay Wilson. Oh, S. Clay Wilson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. yeah okay. Yeah, Captain Fistgums and his pervert pirates. Uh, a crew of bisexual <laughs> okay. male drug addict pirates that are into a series of kinky and outrageous sexual acts. Captain Piscum's nemesis is Captain Fatima and the butch all-female crew of the SS Quivering Thigh. Oh, okay. I did, I, this is a this is a reference that flew over my head when I read it. But apparently, there's a Captain Piscum's reference in uh, League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. <laughs> nice. Um, but again, you know, yeah, even there yeah. too. I mean, I I, I wonder, it, you know, if some of Zap Comics doesn't hold up. I mean, at the time it was was groundbreaking, and but now again, you kind of go back and you're like, eh, some of this is is creaky in a different way. Oh, that's true. Oh, that's true. Although Captain Piscums is always good, I think. Well, that's a great that's a great title for sure. Um, but um, but yeah, yeah. So I mean, I that was sixty eight, by the way. I. I... That was, okay. That the idea, I, th I guess, too, the idea of of comics as novel. Um, uh -huh. I'm not sure when that first kind of really appears. Um, right. Right. As opposed to comics as serial storytelling that doesn't necessarily, you know, add up to anything in the end. When did the when did the tin tin stuff start coming out? That's a good question. Graphic. That would be. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And they are, but but not like I mean, this is long. I mean, I think you know, that, I was surprised yeah. by how long a, this actually is. It takes a while to read, and there's a lot yeah. of dialogue. Yeah, the tin um, ones were, were slim, slim, quite volume. a bit slimmer. Yeah. yeah, as were the Asterix books and that kind of thing. Right. Uh, but again, you know, Japan was always way ahead with this. You know, Japan was publishing phone book sized comics um, almost from the beginning. Um, and that's down to that madman, Tezuka. So if you've ever been into right. the Tez there's a Tezuka Museum in Kyoto, and you go in there and you just look at the, there's just a wall of everything he did, just a single volume. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? Like not, not, not like multiple different versions, just a single volume. And it's a whole wall. You're like, how could any human being produce that much right. in a lifetime? You know? And for it to be consistently good as good. well. As, yeah. I think at his height, he was like 40 or 50 pages of comics a day. I mean, I struggle to get four panels out. <laughs> you know, like I just don't. And I know he would have had assistance later yes. on, but even yes. so, it's still. Yeah, yeah, max. yeah. yeah. I, I don't think he would had quite as much assistance as, for example, um, Gonagai had. Right. right. Gonagai right. was slightly was was famous for farming out stuff a little bit more, right? Like, and and he had brothers as well. The, right? uh, what's the Nagai brothers were. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I think we um, to be drifting somewhat. Well, yes. Yeah. You're yeah. right. You're right. Yes. Right. I was about to start talking about Goggle Thirteen there. Um, <laughs> so let's let's cut yeah, it off so there. That's for another. Yeah. So yeah. Cosmo says that. Mm, I mean, yeah. I, you might be right. It might be just one of those things that the the sands of time might not have been kind to. Um, I don't know. <sighs> I don't know where I would put this in, like, I mean, you don't want to boil it down to simple, you know, you know, thumbs up, thumbs down, but I don't know, mm -hmm. is this something you would rec, I mean, if you were to recommend this to someone, mm -hmm. who would you recommend this to them? Let's put it that way. What's, because um... I wouldn't um... recommend this for all. I, I wouldn't be no, like, no. you got to read this, everyone, you know. Yep. Agreed. Um, no, no, I think just to, uh, certainly to anyone interested in um, comics about seafaring adventures, I guess, um, that's a pretty narrow 
Um, yeah, no, but that's I wasn't bowled over by it. So I, okay, I, I fair enough. It's even more niche than like it's almost like a curate egg kind of thing. Like, is it of interest to anyone who isn't kind of fascinated or interested in just the world of comics? You see whatever. Like, w w do you think this works for a casual reader nowadays? Because I'm thinking maybe not like i think it would kind of tax most people's patience because a lot of it as well is quite it stops dead for a lot of um you know um uh, exposition mm -hmm. yes yeah fairly sure. often yeah um, so it's not yeah it's not exactly a fun a ripping yarn no no which is weird because it's like you said it's between one thing and another and it doesn't satisfy so I don't know if, if anyone really would get this at, apart from like a, a comic nerd. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we can we can throw it out to um, our uh, viewer and ask um, them if they want to yes. chime in and let us know, uh, you know, yeah. what you kind of person is. A fan of Cotto Maltese? <laughs> Have you seen Cotto Maltese? Have you read Cotto Maltese? What did you think of it? Mm -hmm. Do you want to send us money? Anything? Perfect. Yes, yeah. So I um, guess, huh. um, I think yeah, I think I think we can we can leave it there. But um, but I'm interested in following up. But in, that may be largely because and you know there are always going to be fans of comics, primarily for the the art, right? So I think to somebody who who likes right. beautiful art of tropical uh, beach locations and uh, well drawn little kind of uh, you know steamships and stuff like that. Mm. Uh, this maybe that's the person. Maybe it's the person who who wants to um, teach themselves to draw uh, nineteen fifteen right. yes. uh, ships. I think you might have hit the nail on the head there, Nick. I think it's a comic to admire, maybe more than enjoy. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, yeah, almost like a like a coffee table edition. You could see just having like certain panels of it uh, right. just on your wall or something. Yeah, um, as art pieces. Yeah. Okay then. Uh, okay. Right, we'll be uh, talking more comics next time, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, until yep. then, unless we're changing the show uh, uh, to something else, yes, we'll next definitely time be comics next time. We'll be talking about our favorite vegetables. So until <laughs> okay. then, excellent, excellent. Okay.